Hello, hello. So it is a very exciting day to be a Spark fan. So we're right in the middle of the Spark and I Summit, and yesterday was day one. And in the keynote, there was a load of really exciting news. So there's me thinking Spark 3 is going live, Databricks Runtime 7. They're pretty cool. That's that's all it's going to be about, which you can see lots and lots of things about the adaptive query engine, dynamic partition pruning, all of that exciting stuff. But then there's a whole load of announcements dropped. All things like the Delta engine, which is a whole bag of new. Things like Koala's coming live. We've got things like Redash being acquired. We've got the hyperspace engine appearing. So loads of really, really cool stuff got announced yesterday. So I just want to do a quick run through those four main things and just say, what is it? Why you should care, and what's really cool about it. So don't forget to like and subscribe, and yeah, let's see what we can see. So I've just got the blog page up first. So we've got three main announcements coming from Databricks, and let's just take a step through and actually have a look at what they're talking about, what it means to you. So first and foremost, the big news, we have the Delta engine. So this is a brand new Spark engine, or even a replacement for Spark. Now, when that news came out, it's like, sorry, Databricks is moving away from Spark. What? And that's, that's shock tactics. It's not quite there. So all of the Spark API is going to work. You're going to use data frames. The language can be the same. Your code is 100% portable. However, under the hood, the thing that used to actually work out your queries and turn it into um, essentially RDD code, which turned into Java bytecode. So the thing that took a load of data frame API transformations and actions turned into Java to run in a Java virtual machine, which is partly the catalyst engine, that's the query optimizer, partly just the basic core Spark engine. That is being replaced by a new engine that they've called the Delta engine. So instead of being run in Java, it's run in C++. And some of the examples they were going through had the performance comparison of this is what it's like not running it in JVM. And that is massive news. If the new Databricks is not going to run inside JVMs. Okay, well, why do I care? I don't really see it. It's under the hood. It's basically just tin stuff for me. But one of the big performance problems for things like Python and R and all those things that don't natively run inside a JVM, meaning you need an interrupt to go outside and back and back and back between the Spark engine, if they just now run natively in the same box that your Spark core is running in, that's really cool. That can make things really fast. Loads of really interesting stuff in there. So the big, big focus on it is about performance. It's essentially a, I mean, you can almost look at it as just a magic, magic switch underneath the hood. Your things are going to go faster, which is cool. So we get something like this, and this is kind of like the old catalyst picture that we normally get. So you put in some stuff, it thinks about it, it does a cost-based optimizer, and in Spark V2, that was the big thing. So you used to have just a general optimizer, then you had a cost-based optimizer that did a load of planning and then chose the cheapest one. Now you've got adaptive query processing coming in doing some extra stuff. And a lot of that is being baked into this new engine. So the Delta engine, really, really cool. It's going in doing that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of the core, if you dig into the details of what it's talking about, um, it's got really, really much more efficient ways of passing the data into the CPU. Now, Ren Zinn in the, in the keynote for the conference, did some really detailed, this is the assembly code, this is actually the change in how we're passing data transformations to the CPU. And it's a big fundamental paradigm shift in terms of how they're doing that, where essentially it used to be each transformation is send that, that, that one, row by row kind of sending each transformation to the CPU and like lining it up. Now saying, well, actually, there's some things that we can package up, we can vectorize and send a bundle of transformations and do it at once, giving you two, four, eight, or even 16 fold improvements in the speed of processing. So just small bits is crazy efficient uh, in terms of this new engine. So this is outside of Spark 3. This is a separate thing that integrates with Spark 3. Spark 3 sits on. Spark 3 is kind of like we can think of as our all the commands and the, the, the front of house, the things that we use, and then the back end, the thing that takes our commands, turns it into actually just things running on a CPU, is now being replaced by this. So that is really, really, really cool. And entirely new, we don't know too much about it. I'm probably butchering the explanation given it has just, just been announced. Um, my one gripe, did they have to call it Delta? Really? Because already we've got the Delta file format, which is a terribly confusing name for a file format because I talked to a lot of people about 
how are you extracting delta? How are you extracting data? They go, oh, we're doing it in deltas. We're just taking incremental change data, which is normally referred to as a delta. So we're taking their deltas and putting it into a delta file format and now processing it with the delta engine. Just why don't you call everything the same? Um, so that's my only gripe. Other than that, really, really, really cool. So look out for the Delta engine. Uh, they're pushing it out. They're opening previews. Loads of really cool stuff. There's another thing you will hear called the Photon engine, which is an extra optimizer that sits inside that runs inside the Delta engine, which does a lot of the SQL query optimization and makes that stuff a lot better. So you've got two different things heavily, heavily linked. The new Delta engine and then the new Photon engine that sits inside the Delta engine, which is cool. Okay, next one we've got is Koalas. Now, Koalas has been around, it was announced last year, um, for all those people who are big, big Pandas fans. So lots of people who are Python developers, who use Python on-prem and do a lot of data science and that kind of thing, they'll be used to just opening up a Pandas data frame and doing data manipulation through that. It's one of the things that's kind of, kind of the inspiration for the whole data frame API in time of Spark. It feels a lot like using a data frame API, some slight different syntax, some extra features, all that kind of stuff doesn't scale natively on Spark. So Koalas was brought along to say, it's meant to be code parity. It's meant to be trying to give you all, your, all the commands you know and love from Pandas, just run it using the Koalas library, and all the commands will be the same, except it scales natively in Spark. So it's kind of like the, the nice one-to-one, -one, just take that, now scale it. And so that was Koalas, and Koalas have been improving and improving and improving. The big news is they've just reached release 1.0. So you can kind of see all the bits and pieces of being doing so far is kind of like the alpha beta releases getting there. It's it's out there in the wild, but it's not fully, it's not seems like really hard in the production release. This is our first one of saying, Koala's now live. It's now a fully complete product. It's now feature complete. Um, and it has something like 80% uh, parity with the Pandas library. So not everything is in there, but there's a whole lot in there that you can do. So again, yeah, code coverage up to 82% for the data frames, slightly less for series and indexes, but a whole load of stuff in there. Again, I'll drop the link to this blog so you guys can go in there and have a look. But essentially, it's just growing and growing and growing in popularity. As all those people who used Pandas didn't want to throw away their code, their transformations, they didn't want to relearn syntax and use data frames. Now it's a really good place for them to go and it will scale properly, which is awesome. And the big thing is it's compatible with Spark 3. So the new release, the new Spark 3.0 that's just out, can use uh, Koala's 1.0. So awesome, awesome, awesome stuff in there. Okay, there's more details, there's more depths of Koala's and all that kind of stuff, but I won't waste your time because we need to talk about Redash. So Redash, Redish, something like that, uh, is a new acquisition by Databricks. So Databricks have just bought a company called Redash that started around the same time as Databricks. And it's essentially a graphing data viz kind of product. So it's kind of like a, I want to write a SQL query, hit a button and turn that into a visualization, which you can do a bit of inside Databricks already, but this is just adding a whole lot more umph on top of it. Now, the kind of message that we get is that it's not going to replace all your BI tools. It's not a new Power BI, it's not a Tableau Compete, it's not that kind of stuff, but it's just giving you a lot more functionality for the viz that you want to do inside a notebook, inside a dashboard, giving you a lot more functionality in that single place. And then when you need to build a real kind of um, highly interactive, highly functional dashboard, then you put it in a specialist tool. So there's loads of really, really cool stuff. Um, from what we've seen, it mentions in here, it's going to be cross-platform. So we should see it in both AWS and Azure versions of Databricks. Um, and it'll be baked into their existing platform. That's the message. So we're assuming at some point, you'll see it inside the Databricks workspace. You'll be able to go, my dashboards, like you can, can currently, but it's a little bit hidden away and then start doing this kind of stuff. And this is the kind of thing that you see. So people writing a query, makes a table, kind of like in a notebook cell, but then starting to be able to create tabs and visualizations and some different options for how you want to take that data. So it's heavily SQL tuned. It is assuming people are going to be on that high layer writing Spark SQL, uh, and then coming out building nice interactive things, sharing live dashboards, putting it out there. So it's probably just like, increasing the functionality that they have, making it a better offering, making it a more enterprise production professional offering for doing visualization inside Databricks itself, which kind of makes sense for the, the whole, we want to build a data lake house, right? So that kind of whole message of, we want one platform that gives you essentially 
You can do full warehousing, star schemas, good reporting, analytics, as well as real-time streaming, as well as huge, big, big data processing tasks all in one space in a lake. Um, and this is just another tool that helps them complete that vision, make it more of a complete offering that you've got inside Databricks, which again is awesome. Right, number four, the final thing I want to talk about is not a Databricks thing. It's something that was announced yesterday by Microsoft called Hyperscale. Um, no, not a hyperscale, hyperspace. Because again, everyone calls things the same thing. Right, okay, start again. Hyperspace is the new offering from Microsoft, which is essentially indexing, but for a lake. Now, it took me a little while to get my head around exactly what this is talking about. So it's kind of like saying, okay, take, imagine you've got a load of flat files in a lake, and then just put some like sort of um, metadata over the top that allows you to traverse that and get to the data quicker and give you a bit of transactional integrity. And if that's sounding very familiar, kind of, um, or at least that was my mistake when I first read it. So a lot of the, the way they pitched it is adding meta to, metadata to make your queries go faster, which just makes you go, well, that's just Delta Lake. That's the same thing that Delta does on top of Parquet files. And it's when you dig into the depths of it where you realize that's not the case. It's a different implementation, a different, it's not really a, even a different solution to the same problem. They're going about it in very different ways. So whereas Delta Lake is a transactional log and auditing and all that kind of stuff that is heavily, heavily tied into your data, uh, what we're talking about hyperspace is an additional bolt-on uh, index that you can set on top of your data. And your data doesn't have to be parquet. It can be CSVs, it can be audio files, it can be various other things. So it's augmenting your existing data that is in situ with some additional uh, metadata and some additional objects to help speed that stuff up. So it's similar kind of idea, but actually very different, very different the way they've approached it. Now, there's well some interesting things in there. Uh, I just want to kind of highlight that point first, just so we can talk about what this thing actually is. So if we're on Delta Lake, we have a load of Parquet files. And they could be in folders that could have proper Spark partitioning. It might not. I could just have just a, a file system that's full of just random Parquet files. And if I make that into a Delta table, then I get a JSON transaction log. So every time I add files and remove files, I get a little bit of JSON made saying, I've added these files, I've removed these files, and it's kind of my audit trail for everything I've done. Now, for the performance side of things, uh, I've got some statistics inside there. So inside JSON, I've got a minimum, maximum, and a count. So for each column in each of my parquet files, I know well in this parquet file, the minimum value, and I've got the maximum value. So I can kind of just augment my data with this statistics. Now, what that means is if I run a query and say, I only want data where this column is equal to C, it can go, well, based on the minimum and maximum, C is outside of that range, it's outside of that range, it's in that range, and so I can selectively partition prune. So that dynamic partition pruning, which is one of the big Spark 3.0 things that we're looking at, uh, really, really is affected by this. Uh, you know, kind of generally, the, the, the Spark engine is quite good at going, I'm going to make things faster by reading the Delta transaction log. But that only helps me if I've got my data stored as Delta, and if I've sorted it on the way in. Because if my data is just completely unsorted, it's a massive heap, then each of my ranges here is just going to be A to H. And I'm not going to partition prune everything because I've got a little bit of everything inside every file. Uh, and there's, there's techniques such as Z ordering, which is sorting the data and then sorting inside the files, which will help all of that stuff. Um, but essentially, that is Delta. That is Delta. That is the Delta plan is separate transaction log, heavily, heavily tied to my data. So over on the hyperspace side, similar idea. I've got some Parquet. I've loaded it into my data, uh, database already. That is sitting as Parquet, not currently Delta. So currently, hyperspace doesn't support Delta. That I'm assuming is on the roadmap. And I create an index. Now, the weird concept is, this is very much like a covering non-clustered index back in SQL Server days. So this is taking a copy of my data. I'm taking a full copy of my data or of the columns I've decided to include in this index, sorting them, and then maintaining my index on top of that. So if I get a query and someone says, again, give me the data where it's equal to C, it doesn't go to my data. It goes to my index, just reads the index, and pulls that data back. So there's some pros and cons of this. Obviously, it means I need to keep several full copies of my data if I'm indexing via several different columns. It is a fairly chunky approach to doing this stuff. And obviously, if I've got a vast amount of data, 
I'm going to end up with a huge amount of overhead in having these indexes. Also, currently, it's on me to maintain those indexes. So if I go and change the data in that, I need to manually hit a refresh my index and rebuild that data set. You know, so there's some kind of like very SQL familiar concepts going on there in terms of maintaining and managing these things. But this is a version 0.1 release. This is brand spanking new, just open sourced, just available for people to have a look at. Now, the interesting thing of that is obviously you can do it on top of so many different files. So if you have a load of Delta files and they're all optimized and Z ordered and you're getting the data in right, but you also have a massive collection of other data that isn't as well managed, it isn't as well looked after, and you want to say, I want to make it quicker and easier for people to query those files, then you create some indexes on the top without touching that data, but making a copy of the data. Um, and there's going to be questions around, you know, how much extra time are we adding on to our ETL processing by treating multiple copies of the data that are indexed? Uh, what kind of automations can we see there? And again, it's very immature. We'll see a lot more stuff coming there. So it's a super interesting idea. Maybe you won't get that much out of it if you're already using Delta Lake, you're already Z ordering, you've already got a fairly robust management process. It's kind of solving a problem that you've already solved by adding those things in. But it's an extra tool in your belt. So that's kind of what Hyperspace is. Um, so it is open source. You can go and get her, grab a, the SBT file and build a jar, put it into your Spark cluster. You can start using it uh, from 2.4. It's not Spark 3.0 compatible yet. Um, now, the interesting thing for me is the like Azure signups and a lot of that stuff, it's Scala, Python, and .NET support. So again, there's no R. There's kind of like a missing gap where R would be in the Microsoft world. Um, but yeah, interesting stuff and open source. So kind of a thing, it's going to be a thing that you can pull into your data risk clusters. If you see that as a little missing gap and you go, oh, I'd quite like that, you can pull it in and start using it when you need to if you want to try that out. Um, yeah. Definitely interesting, and for me, completely unexpected. It was kind of like, oh, here's some news I completely wasn't aware of and didn't know was coming up. So yeah, super, super interesting stuff. There's me wandering into the uh, Spark AI Summit going, Spark 3, kind of know what's coming, and then loads of super interesting news. Delta Engine, massive, going to be a big impact on lots of people. Maybe an invisible impact. Maybe kind of a transparent thing of just your queries will go faster and you don't really know it's happening but it's kind of huge when you think about what's under the hood of it. Koalas, again, just getting more robust, just getting more fully featured, just becoming a bigger, more robust thing that more people can adopt and pick up. Redash, cool. Visualizations, completing that lake house story for Databricks, making it more of a complete offering, and it'd be really good to see it when it's there about how natively people can pick up doing the querying, doing the work on it. Uh, one of the interesting things I didn't mention is they do have better IntelliSense on the SQL side than you do have inside Databricks notebooks. So one of the complaints I get from SQL people is, oh, I don't, I, it's, not, it's not like using Azure Data Studio or Management Studio. I don't like the SQL interface. But if this is going to read Hive and actually have proper IntelliSense and feels more like a native SQL querying engine, then that's just going to make adoption so much easier and bring all the analysts on board into keeping it inside a data rich cluster, which is cool. And then Hyperspace, which is really awesome for certain use cases, very new, but definitely something to keep an eye on as it evolves, as the open source community picks it up, and as it becomes a more and more fully featured product, gonna be super, super interesting. And that's just day one. So we'll be back in the summit uh, later today. We'll see what's coming up in Keynote 2. Uh, and yeah, we'll report back tomorrow on what's cool. If you like anything, you've got a question about anything, you want us to talk about anything, drop a note in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll pop some videos up that all you can watch next if you want to. All right, have a good one.